Terrific, let's get started then. Great. So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Lindsay Hinks. I work at Lucille Packard Foundation for Children's Health and I partner very closely with the Sean N. Parker Center for Allergy and Asthma Research to fundraise for their mission. Uh, there is so much happening in the world right now, not just the COVID pandemic, and the doctors and I want to acknowledge that. We are here with you and we are thinking of you. During this challenging time, it means even more to us that you're spending the next hour with us learning. So thank you so much for participating. We are all here today to discuss another important topic, the COVID-19 related research being conducted at Stanford University and more specifically at the center. The center has been very busy continuing our work on food allergy and allergic diseases in addition to COVID-19 related research. We've been working with a skeleton staff really embracing telehealth, working from home as much as possible, but of course that impacts the ability to be in the clinic in the lab. Our work has never been more important as food allergy is considered a deadly disease. If someone stops treatment for any length of period, it can have really long-term health effects. And as you all know, thanks in huge part to your generosity, the center is an absolute powerhouse of clinical trials, running 20 plus more per year with a staff of about 60. Because of this, Stanford University called upon the center to be of service when the COVID-19 pandemic hit and doctors Nadeau, Shinthraja and Boyd answered with enthusiasm. We've now pivoted 12 staff members on the center to focus specifically on COVID research, including vaccine work, therapies, managing the biobank of samples, and so much more. Like many of our colleagues, we're being asked to do more with less. The center is dipping into our discretionary fund to shore up these additional costs to COVID related research, and that makes us even more grateful for the continued support of our community. We are so incredibly thankful for the Sunshine Charitable Foundation who gave a recent gift that helped our lab costs for about one month, but there's still so much more that we can do. We hope you feel pride in the work that we're doing to advocate for the families that we serve, provide care, and find answers and pursue research to this virus. We're fortunate to have three physician scientists join us today, each of which have a very unique perspective on their COVID-19 related work. Dr. Kari Nadeau, Dr. Scott Boyd, and Dr. Sharon Chindraja. First, we'll hear from Kari, who will give a state of the center and why they've been brought into this type of research. Next, Scott will join us and share his incredible work on antibody testing. He truly is leading the way at Stanford University, and I think you all will be really excited about what's going on. And lastly, we'll end with Kari and with Sharon, sharing their information about the inpatient and outpatient work that they're doing, testing immunity, um, viral shedding, and so much more. Before we get to Kari, before I introduce her, just some very light housekeeping. Again, if you're just joining us, the chat function has been disabled, and the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, you should be using that. So please, throughout the webinar, engage with us, ask questions. No question is wrong. We want to hear from you. And lastly, this webinar is being recorded. So without further ado, I want to introduce Dr. Kari Nado. Dr. Nadeau is the director of the Sean N. Parker Center for Allergy and Asthma Research at Stanford University. She is the Natasee Foundation Professor of Pediatric Food Allergy, Immunology, and Asthma, and the Natasee Foundation Medical Director of Precision Medicine. She runs a team of specialists running everything from food allergy, asthma, and immunology to chemical engineering, health policy, and statistics, and so much more. She's been on the forefront of our COVID-19 response at Stanford University, working with both adult and pediatric patients. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Kari Nadeau. Oh, Kari, you're on mute. Thank you, everyone. We really appreciate your time today. And Lindsay, thank you for that introduction. Although I don't feel deserving, I really feel like it takes a team effort, especially in pandemics, especially during this critical time. All of those that have joined the call and the series, thank you so much for attending. And we care about your children, we care about you, we care about your families, and we really hope that today is instructive and helpful. I wanna thank 
everyone in the foundation as well, the Lucio Packer Foundation for Children's Health, have been incredible in their setup today. And it took time and energy to put this together. I also want to thank my colleagues, Dr. Sharon Shifraja and Dr. Scott Boyd, for being part of this session because they have done work and have been able to do all of this during the essential lockdown. And we really want to compliment each other and our teams to be able to have the data and the introduction today that we're going to be able to show you. It's been a really heavy week, and I want to share the fact that we all have similar purpose to do good and serve others, and that's been lifting me up during the weight of the pandemic. But this week, the tragedy of the racial injustice and senseless deaths and suffering of so many people have affected us all, and we've been thinking about you and your families, and we want to let you know that our hearts are with you. I also want to thank each of you for your partnership and support because what we're going to talk about could not happen without the support of others. We're very grateful for the Sunshine Foundation and now more than ever we need the support of the community and to be able to help each other, to lift up each other, and to protect our children and their families. The pandemic has been critical to watch around the globe. I know that we've seen a lot of suffering, but I think we also have seen a lot of people overcoming it. And that has given me a hope and promise that we can continue to work hard. There's a lot of published media, and importantly, is we need to see what the science is showing us, what the science will show us in order to get data that we can count on for strong facts that we can trust and that we can show the community so that you can trust how to best manage this pandemic in the future. Part of the consequences of this pandemic, and I'm sure many of you are calling from New York City and Boston and other areas around the country where there are people that have suffered so much due to this, and I hope that your families and children are safe. Within that, there has been a lot of food insecurity. And because a lot of you know this directly with food allergy, we depend on labels, we depend on certain food items to be available in the supermarket and at our ability to be able to purchase these goods either direct to consumer from the web or in certain special places that we go to get food that we know we can trust that we know the labels that has all changed there's been incredible food insecurity across the world and i think that's affecting us because we can't get the safe foods we need especially food allergy families there's an even higher worry about being able to make sure that we can protect ourselves and protect our children. And for that reason, I felt compelled to also try to understand the pandemic and COVID research. I also received from you a lot of questions early on whether or not food allergy itself could increase the risk of COVID-19. And could COVID-19 infection itself increase the risk of having food allergies? And so I'm always inspired by your questions. And many of you on the phone know that. And we believe in community-based participation in our center. And because of that, when those questions were asked of me as early as February, I thought it would be appropriate to really make sure that we can understand this better. And you're gonna hear some of those initial results already from Sharon. We have already, thanks to the been able to look at the difference between allergy and asthma and whether or not that increases your risk of COVID. And what we found so far is it's basically a very interesting story. Those people with allergies and asthma have a change in their molecular receptors. And we use these receptors for many things, but in addition, the virus uses these receptors as well. If you guys want to know, they're called angiotensin converting enzyme receptors. So what happens is the virus co-ops our own body's natural receptors, the receptors being the angiotensin converting enzyme, and it so happens to be, and we don't understand why yet, but globally, we've now approached this throughout the world, many different ethnicities, we've just submitted the paper for publication in a peer-reviewed literature, but it looks like those people with allergies and asthma have less of this receptor. So we don't know why yet, but that's something that's good. 
that perhaps relatively speaking, and this is highly novel and also very preliminary, so please just know you're getting to hear it for the first time today, it might be that you're relatively protected. Okay, that's good. But on the other side, the flip side is that people with allergies and asthma tend to make more mucus. And mucus tends to attract virus particles. And when we expel those virus particles, we have a high rate of having those little viruses in what we cough or in what we sneeze. So people with allergies and asthma tend to, as you all know, have a tough time when they get viral illnesses or coughing or colds. And so with that, it's probably a net zero that people with food allergies don't have a higher rate of getting COVID. But it's important to know that medications should be used. They should help you fight your allergies and asthma. There's no reason not to take those medications. We want people with allergies and asthma to continue their medications. During the shelter in place, we continue to see patients in our allergy clinical research unit. And I was very thankful to Stanford for understanding that food allergy research is essential research. We could not stop dosing patients. And that's really important that the community understood that, that if we stop dosing patients that were getting food allergy therapy, we could perhaps lead them to a higher risk of having food allergies again or having worsening asthma. And so because of that, we were compelled to keep everything open and in addition, add COVID research to our already busy schedules. But that was okay. We want to make sure that we help. There's a lot of interest in whether or not this virus itself could lead to allergies and asthma. And so we've been studying how people that already had the virus and that didn't have allergies and asthma, could they turn on the cells that actually are what we call allergic cells? And we're just studying that right now. And for those people around the world that got COVID, unfortunately, and many of us will potentially be at risk for getting COVID because we will likely see this epidemic continue, that we need to understand the risk by which COVID infections could increase allergies and asthma. And we're studying that right now, doing immune studies, looking at different cell types, and Scott is doing a lot of work now to try to unravel the puzzle of how the COVID virus and allergies and asthma can occur. And I wanna talk a little bit about how we've been doing service to the community, how we've been doing service to Stanford. Lindsay talked a little bit about the fact that our whole group, because we know how to do clinical research studies, we know how to do science, Scott's lab, Sharon's group of the clinical research unit, many of you have been there and you've seen our floor in the hospital. We were kind of set up already and primed to make sure that our knowledge could be helpful towards the COVID epidemic. Many other centers were being shut down because they were not seen as essential research. And because we were, and we still are, we felt that we wanted to give of our hearts, of our minds to help in this very difficult pandemic. And so I wanna thank all of you for partnering with us to make sure that we could do that. There's a lot of strategies about how to do allergies trials moving forward in the future with COVID-19. Our center is going to be involved in all of them. We're working actively with the FDA and the EMEA in Europe to be able to make sure that our food allergy trials are safe and that parents and families are protected against COVID-19 infection, that no one is at increased risk when they come in to do our research trials and to continue to participate in them. And so we want to make sure you all know that we're being very careful and our guidelines now are being used by other centers to reopen up so they, they can see food allergy patients. So with that, I also want to introduce Scott. I'll continue to talk about this involvement later on, but Scott is in charge of the diagnostics and antibody testing at COVID at Stanford. It's, um, it's a pretty tall hat to fill and, and big shoes to fill, but Scott can do that in spades. He's a tenured track associate professor in pathology and has the endowed faculty scholar by the Crown family in allergy and immunology at Stanford University. His lab studies healthy as well as pathogenic human immune response in the context of vaccination to COVID. 
infectious diseases and allergy. We hope you'll discuss and ask many questions to Scott as he continues. He'll present his work first, and then you can ask questions. Among many things, Scott is also a Rhodes Scholar, and he is also the recipient of 2019 Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. Scott, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Corey. Um, and I, I'm happy to have the chance to present to this, uh, this audience as well. Um, I don't think it would be an exaggeration to say that the last few months, it's really felt like uh, we all had to respond to a fire alarm and really take quick action to try to help the situation with the pandemic. And one of the aspects about the kind of science that we do normally, and that in my case, my, my lab is focused on is um, we've been training and studying the human immune system for our whole careers, essentially, you know, ever since I started medical school, um, understanding how the immune system works has really been one of my main uh, areas of focus. And, you know, in the, in the context of the allergy and food allergy disease topics, um, that's something that we've done a lot of work on trying to study one particular part of the immune system, which are the cells that make the IgE antibodies um, that are the way, the, the reason that people who have food allergy um, have unhealthy reactions to particular kinds of foods and ways to tra um, treat those um, food allergies and help people to be able to you know, tolerate the, the foods and avoid the danger of a, a, an allergic reaction. Um, but an interesting aspect of the science behind this is that the antibodies, um, they come in various different flavors in the human body. And antibodies are also very important for protecting you against viruses and bacteria. And so that's um, something that was relatively easy for us to switch um, a lot of uh, attention to studying when this new virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus appeared and began to infect people in the United States and elsewhere in the world. Um, so I, I was gonna show just a little bit of a, a picture of the kind of work that we've been doing to analyze the human immune response to the virus. Um, I'll share my screen now so you can see, the, see what I'm talking about. Let's see, there we go. So um, what you see here, this is a picture of the virus that causes COVID-19, the virus they call SARS-CoV-2. And you know, it, it has its, its own little genome inside. It has these spike proteins that are stuck on the outside. Um, the ideal situation you wanna have if you get exposed to the virus is that your immune system recognizes it and neutralizes it. And the way that happens is because the immune system makes these proteins called antibodies. They look like these little Y-shaped molecules. You can see in this diagram that they can basically bind to the spike proteins of the virus and prevent it from infecting your cells. So that's, that's basically the place that we want to get to in uh, having somebody have an immune response that would protect them. Um, in some cases that may happen because the person gets the infection and recovers from it and now their immune system is ready to deal with the virus if they see it again. But it's also the way that we expect a vaccine would be able to protect people um, in future um, and you know efforts to develop vaccines are underway and going at a great pace right now. Um, a lot of the testing that we've been working on at Stanford developing is to detect whether somebody has antibodies that recognize the SARS-CoV-2 virus specifically. And I, I feel like I, I have to distinguish between, there's been some press about other antibody testing that's been done by some other faculty members at Stanford using um, some point of cure devices. Um, that's different from the work that we've been doing. And one of the confusing aspects about this pandemic situation has been, there's been a lot of um, tests and test kits being sold on the market that haven't necessarily been fully evaluated to see whether they're accurate in the answers that they give. So one of our main priorities has been to have reliable testing to tell people whether they have been exposed to SARS-CoV-2, um, to test for the virus itself, but then also accurately to test for the immune system's response to it. So we can tell if somebody has a protective response that would then prevent them from being infected in future. Um, so the uh, this next picture I was just gonna show briefly is um, the kind of assay that we've been developing is one where we can take a little part of the virus's spike protein and we can put it into a, the well of a plastic plate and add the patient's plasma or serum to that. If there are antibodies that recognize the virus specifically, they'll bind and stick to it. And then we can wash away the ones that didn't bind and we can detect whether those antibodies were stuck by using a, a special additional kind of antibody that has a colored reaction product that it can generate. 
Um, this will tell us if that person had been exposed to SARS-CoV-2 or not. Um, so this is something that we brought up uh, live in the clinical lab on April 7th after a, a lot of work in a short time frame. And it's now been the basis for us to be able to evaluate who's, who's been exposed and potentially just to uh, give some guidance about who may be uh, protected against infection. So that's just one aspect. And you know, here's a, a bit more of the detail. This is actually a, a sort of high resolution picture of what the spike really looks like. And some of the antibodies that are most important are the ones that bind this little part that sticks up because that's what the virus needs to try to uh, infect your cell with. So we want the antibodies to block that. Um, so that's just a bit of a bit of a background. Um, and uh, you know, it's, it's clear that the disease caused by SARS-CoV-2 can be severe and it can affect children as well as adults. Um, one of the things that we've found in recent weeks um, and I guess over the past couple months is that um, sometimes when children are infected by SARS-CoV-2, they can have a dangerous inflammatory reaction that affects the blood vessels, including those that, um, that feed the heart and other parts of the body. So part of the way that we're trying to address that topic is by understanding the immune system, how it can defend the person's body against the virus, and to help advance the development of vaccines so that people can be protected before they ever get infected or exposed. So those are some of the things that are, you know, occupying our every waking moment nowadays. Um, you know, in addition to being able to carry on the, um, the excellent work in terms of the uh, allergy research, um, because of the urgency of the pandemic situation, we've been putting a lot of effort into these aspects of understanding the immune system's response to the virus. And it's, uh, it's really a topic that, uh, you know, we, uh, I think we're privileged to be at Stanford, where we're surrounded by many colleagues that are um, talented, and are dedicated to helping with these sort of topics. Um, and I would have to say as a scientist, I've never encountered a period of time in my career where there's been such a spirit of cooperation amongst all the scientists and physicians um, that we've worked with both here at Stanford and at other institutions. A lot of times in academia, there can sometimes be you know, competitive interactions between people in different labs. They each wanna be the first to publish a paper on a particular topic, for example, but what I've found is that uh, a lot of that has gone by the wayside and people are just sort of putting their minds together and working together to try to answer the key questions and actually help um, all the people that are being affected by this new infectious disease. Um, and that's been uh, very rewarding and, uh, you know, it's made it, it's made all the hard work, um, you know, uh, quite enjoyable, to be honest. It's, uh, it's something where you really see the, the good um, rising to the top in people, um, especially in the troubled times that we're now experiencing with the, uh, other larger societal issues. It gives me hope that we will get through this pandemic. We will come up with vaccines that work. We'll be able to manage the disease in people who do get infected, you know, increasingly better as time goes on. And um, I'm, I just feel very happy to be part of that effort and part of the, um, our center that's working on these topics with full attention. So I, um, yeah, I wanna thank you for your support as well. And I have the great pleasure of introducing uh, Sharon next, who's uh, going to give her, her a description of her work. Um, Sharon Chintraja is a clinical associate professor in medicine and pediatrics. She's the director of our clinical translation research unit and the Koch Clinic. Um, she's the Corell Endowed Faculty Scholar in Allergy and Immunology and is a wonderful translational researcher investigating, investigating immune mechanisms in food allergy and asthma. She has really led the team conducting many of the clinical trials in food allergy and asthma at our center, and also those into allergic rhinitis and atopic dermatitis. Um, she's been the, uh, the lead for several COVID-19 clinical trials as, trials as well, rising to the occasion of the pandemic. And, um, and she's been one of the people helping to understand the, um, the drug called remdesivir and see how it can be used to help patients in this uh, time of urgency. So um, Sharon, I look forward to hearing your comments and I'm happy to be here today. Thanks so much, Scott, for your amazing updates and a uh, very kind introduction. Um, you know, what Scott's doing is so um, key to our understanding of how to move forward uh, in this pandemic. Um, and uh, I'm sure many of you will have questions um, that, that Scott and others are trying to answer here. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm an allergy, immunology, and pulmonary critical care uh, physician. I first had the spark uh, to become interested in immunology um, when I was taking care of sick 20-year-old patients in the ICU 
um, during the H1N1 pandemic in 2008 um, and during my training in Boston, immunology touches all fields uh, for researchers and physicians looking for answers to questions about the why, uh, oftentimes the answer lies in our immune response. I joined the center seven years ago because I was excited to be part of this team that looks at the science behind why a particular treatment approach works or doesn't work. Um, and I currently direct our clinical research unit where we run clinical trials in allergy and asthma and now uh, COVID-19. I've had the pleasure of meeting uh, many of you and your children in our center, and I hope that you all are keeping healthy and safe. Um, and thank you so much for joining us today. Therapies for COVID are an immediate need, um, so we can go back to life as we once knew it. Our food allergy families are quite familiar with the social distancing and the vigilance uh, needed in large gatherings um, with regards to food. And now we all are getting a taste of this, so to speak. Um, and it is really hard. We empathize with many of you who have been doing this for so long. COVID-19 uh, is a global crisis. And as Kari and Scott have already um, spoken to, we felt compelled to answer the call. Um, and share our expertise really in conducting clinical trials in the, in the COVID realm. We were very happy to partner with our hospitalist colleagues, the heroes um, who are taking care of patients hospitalized with severe COVID-19 infection. And with them, we've been able to contribute to the field in a rigorous way with randomized clinical trials to test if and where new therapies will have an impact. And so I'd like to share with you two trials that we've been involved with, um, with two different approaches. One targeting the virus and uh, one targeting the inflammatory cascade. Um, one of which is uh, the study with remdesivir. So we were part of the uh, team studying remdesivir. This study was sponsored by the NIH, uh, by Tony Fauci's team, and was recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, and it was a remarkable uh, effort to take a drug that was originally studied in Ebola, uh, looked promising in SARS and MERS, and pivot quickly to uh, conduct a randomized trial across 60 centers across the globe uh, to enroll 1,000 patients in two months at the height of the pandemic. Um, so a little bit about remdesivir, it's an IV infusion. It's a nucleoside analog that literally puts a wrench in the viral replication process. And the aim is to decrease the amount of virus in our body. Uh, patients in this study were randomized one-to-one, -one, so meaning um, that they either received remdesivir or placebo infusion daily for 10 days. And um, we were very excited uh, to hear the early results um, that remdesivir, uh, those who had received remdesivir, had a significantly shorter time to recovery, 11 days compared to those who had received placebo, 15 days. And it was shown to have the most benefit in those hospitalized patients that required oxygen. Um, and then uh, not so robust a difference between those pa patients who were actually sicker um, with more lung damage requiring lung support with either uh, a mechanical ventilator or high flow oxygen. And these findings really highlight the need to identify the infection early and start antiviral treatment before the pulmonary disease progresses to require mechanical ventilation. Um, the NIH and the FDA thought these were really important findings and they wanted to report it to the public early. And in fact, the FDA has made remdesivir available um, to those patients who are hospitalized with severe COVID-19 disease under an emergency use authorization. So this is just amazing from start to finish, the design of a clinical study and to put it in the hands of patients who need it most in such a quick time 
um, so that we have something in our arsenal to uh, treat patients hospitalized with COVID-19. It's not, um, it doesn't treat everybody. It's not the perfect drug for everybody, but it's a start. Um, and another approach uh, that many are looking at is um, not targeting the virus, but targeting the immune response to the virus by blocking certain inflammatory cytokines. On the one hand, we need a robust immune response, like you've heard um, Scott tell us about, to eradicate the cells infected with the virus. Um, but a consequence of that is that we might have an over-exuberant response or prolonged inflammatory response that leads then to organ damage, and most importantly, lung damage, uh, in my opinion, in COVID-19, um, that then puts you at a different level of care and monitoring um, and severity. We've seen that uh, interleukin-6 is an inflammatory cytokine that's been a biomarker of severe COVID-19 infection. It's also been important and studied for a long time in other inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, sepsis, autoimmune conditions, and there are already FDA approved drugs on the market to treat some of those um, inflammatory conditions. Tocilizumab is an antibody blocking the IL-6 receptor, so it blocks the signaling. And it was already approved for other inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and so in the early days of the pandemic um, in China, they used uh, tocilizumab for patients hospitalized with severe COVID-19 pneumonia and were able to see improvement in the clinical symptoms and also in the imaging of the lung damage on CAT scans. And so we are now part of a phase three randomized control trial um, to be able to evaluate whether tocilizumab, where and uh, in which patients tocilizumab will prove to be most um, effective. Um, so we've talked about one approach targeting the virus and one approach targeting the immune system. We're very lucky that the NIH study is continuing actually onto part two um, called ACT2, um, where it's combining both approaches um, using remdesivir to target the virus and uh, baricitinib, which is an uh, oral anti-inflammatory targeting um, the JAK12 pathways. And so it's a one-two punch um, to try and combat COVID-19. Uh, and we're excited to be um, participating in these ongoing studies and, and others. So I've shared with you two studies that we're doing for hospitalized patients with our colleagues. Um, as many of you know, uh, only 15% of patients infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus end up hospitalized. Uh, the majority have mild or asymptomatic disease and actually recover within their home. Um, but, you know, some people do a better job of sheltering in place than others. And so really we don't um, truly understand the effect of SARS-CoV-2 infection within our community. Um, we're excited to be designing ways to study patients in their home, um, particularly our allergy and asthma patients using uh, mobile health platforms and digital solutions. Um, we're also really interested to know how this pandemic has affected our food allergy families. As Kari spoke to earlier about food insecurity, um, and we've designed a national survey to assess this across different populations and in different cities. Um, and so uh, we'd love for all of you to participate in that as well. Um, and then we're also very privileged to be able to see patients who are recovering from COVID-19 and want to contribute to the field of our research in understanding how the long-term immunity um, to the virus, to you know, what Scott was speaking to, what Kari and others across Stanford are, are, um, are doing, which is so important. Um, it's you know, one of the highlights of my week when I, when I get to see those patients and they're so grateful that they had access to care, um, access to clinical trials, and uh, are really wanting to give back um, to the community uh, to try and understand and move the research forward to develop better therapeutics and, and vaccines. 
Um, and then lastly, I, I wanted to um, make sure that all of you are receiving our regular updates via email. Um, we send out uh, updates on what's going on in our center while we're still open uh, during the pandemic on food allergies, allergies, and COVID. Um, if you are not, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'll make sure that we add you um, to our list. And, uh, and now I'm gonna turn it back to Kari. Um, just a reminder that the Q&A is open for questions. So please feel free to submit your questions now and then Lindsay will moderate after Kari finishes. Kari, you're muted again. Thanks so much, Scott and Sharon, for sharing that great information. Really appreciate it. I want to reiterate Sharon's remarks about the importance of therapies for COVID. And obviously, there's been a lot of insights just in three months when you have the right teams, when you have the right fervor, when you have that motivation, when people are working so hard. We've now seen how the FDA and how our regulatory boards can move so quickly. So I think in a good light, there's been a lot of things done efficiently that hopefully will also help food allergy research and, out, and research in general with clinical trials. I also want to, again, emphasize that thanks to um, the Sunshine Foundation, thanks to some preliminary funding, we were able to help out right away with key people on the ground to be able to do these critical trials that helped with the um, studies, for example, the New England Journal work. We're also, because we're pediatricians, we care about families, Sharon has trained both in children and adult medicine, so has Scott, we really care about the family unit. And we know that COVID and allergies and asthma affect all ages, and they affect all ages differently. And so we need to understand the role of how these diseases are associated with each other and how they spread. And so one of the critical things that we're doing research in now is collecting 100 families, 100 households across the Bay Area, so six counties, where we had a lot of households affected originally in January and February, and then we have household contacts, children, and the elderly, grandparents, that have lived cooperatively in these family units, and we're studying to what degree people are still shedding viruses, whether or not they're shedding viruses in their saliva or in their nasal secretions. And if someone has, in one of the members of the family, if they've lost their COVID disease, if they've recovered, can they get it back again from someone in their family who might not have had a lot of symptoms? And we need to test this and these 100 families, and we hope to have this even be expanded to more families if we can and hopefully those of you interested, we'd love to engage your partnership in that. But one of the key features that we want to understand is, well, how fast do we need to diagnose? Many people, as you know, 80% of the public, 80% of the people that get COVID-19, don't know if they actually had it, that it's mild or they're asymptomatic. And during that phase of trying to understand, or should they be worried? or should they not be? Do I have a fever? Do I have a cough? How do I call my doctor? How do I get tested? So people that are initially tested, we will retest again because if they're negative initially, it's important to follow it up because if they're still having symptoms, we can't rule out whether or not they were negative or positive just based on one nasal swab. So we'll continue to test people over time and that's what we're doing for these 100 families. And what we're doing is Every week, we're having them come back into the clinic for the first month, and then after a month, everyone returns monthly. And luckily, Stanford set up a special clinic for coronavirus positive patients called the Crown Clinic, Corona for Clown. Uh, and so that makes sense. We are all part of this, and we want to help families, and specifically children. Scott mentioned about these um, vascular, the inflammation that's happening in the vessels of children sometimes later on it's called m i s dot c and we want to understand how this is affecting children and adults as well and then also pregnant women we're finding now that when we're testing pregnant women their symptoms are lasting for much longer and they're shedding virus for a lot longer the babies that they're delivering are totally safe they don't get covid 
but importantly, we want to understand the degree by which they're protected against COVID. So we're very focused on moms, kids, families, grandparents. How do we protect people? How does your antibody response, like Scott was mentioning, protect you for the long run? No one knows. So we're one of the few places that started this protocol right away to enroll patients in 100 families so that we could follow them over time. And I'm really excited about that. And I want to also talk about something Scott and Sharon mentioned, which is vaccines. There's been a lot of interest in this, and clearly there's a good reason that we need to be able to think about prevention. There are two major categories that I want to talk about. There's the monoclonal antibodies that are being made by Eli Lilly, a company called Absolera, Regeneron, in which you have one antibody that's synthesized by a company to try to inhibit the virus. But that's one antibody. Typically in nature, we have a lot of different antibodies that try to cover the virus to protect us from the virus. And that's also what Scott studies in terms of naturally, what does our immune system look like when we have to combat an active viral infection. So to try to give ourselves a vaccine before any of us get the infection is very important. How do we prompt, how do we get that immune system activated? Just like measles vaccines, just like other vaccines that we get early on in life, how do we create a vaccine that helps us sustain immunity and is permanently helpful for the long run? That is being discussed. I want to make sure we answer your questions and give you lots of time to ask them. But what we now know from the vaccine research that's going on, and we can clarify a lot of it hopefully today for you, is there's about 118 vaccines that are being worked on. There's five different categories of those vaccines, and they rank from using a piece of the virus in its own little DNA to try to put it into someone's body and create an immune response. They also can use other viruses to be able to co-opt that virus, put into little pieces of the COVID infection or the COVID virus, and that in and of itself activates the immune system. You've also heard a lot about Moderna. Moderna has an RNA-based vaccine, and not that all of you should know all of these different types of vaccines, but I want to explain or at least get the concept that this is a lot of science. To be able to bring that science to the area of vaccine research is critical. So none of this would have happened without a lot of science behind, and it's been so actively fervent, as Scott was mentioning. And so because people have been nimble and been able to completely turn 180 on whatever virus they might have been working on, and now they're totally working on COVID, we have these vaccines at our doorsteps. Moderna is an RNA vaccine. There are other RNA vaccines too, but if you use this little molecule called RNA, it's very unstable. And so you need to make sure you protect it and create a type of stable structure so that you could use it around the globe potentially in environments that don't have refrigeration. We have a lot of questions about vaccine research. We want to make sure it's ethical. We want to make sure that it gets to everyone, that we don't have a distribution pattern that leaves other people in the dust and that we wanna make sure that if we're gonna get a vaccine that's rigorously tested. There's a lot of irrational exuberance right now around vaccine research, and that's appropriate. There's situational needs for that right now, but we need to look at the data. Right now, Moderna only has eight patients that they've shown that has their neutral, have neutralizing antibody. There's some other vaccines coming out of China that have also shown in small amounts of patients that there's some neutralizing antibody. That's fantastic and that vaccines will likely work. We have a lot of hope and promise that vaccines in the same class of viruses, polio vaccine, other vaccine types have worked, and that this virus mutates at a relatively lower rate than let's say influenza. So there is hope that these vaccines will actually have an effect and stick. To the degree that we need to vaccinate once or we need to vaccinate over and over and over again, for example, like the flu, we don't know that yet. And then in addition, I wanna make sure that all of you know the timelines are critical. We've taken a timeline that typically takes five years and scrunched it down to maybe 12 months. And when you do that, you have to be super careful. We have to make sure the public trust continues in our ability to science. We do not want to do any harm. 
and there's a great need, but there's also a great need to know what we can do and what we can't do. And for that, we need to test efficacy and safety and be super careful and efficient. And so with that, luckily the NIH has put together a fast track kind of uh, group. It's called the active group. And the best case scenario is that there'll be a huge trial for vaccine research starting in July, about 20,000 people that get the vaccine, about 10,000 people that don't. And with that, they'll see whether or not, if there's enough rate of underlying COVID infections, they're gonna see whether or not that vaccine protects compared to not. And they'll probably use, and Scott, forgive me if I uh, overspeak here, but they'll probably use some of the same types of assays that Scott has developed in his lab to be able to know whether or not this vaccine is working. Importantly is that this takes time. This takes a lot of forethought. Companies now are moving forward and the president has this warp speed program. And what does that mean? That means that there will be a stockpile of vaccines made before they're necessarily tested in groups of patients. So that if they are tested and they're efficacious and they're safe, then they'll be ready right away to be able to use in man. And this is not the first time that a program like that occurred. In the Salk vaccine for polio, this is the same thing that happened. The March of Dimes provided money to be able to have manufacturers stockpile the vaccine so that when one worked, it was ready to give to people. So I'm excited that everything is moving forward, but we have to make sure that we are very careful about it, very thoughtful. There are eight vaccines in clinical trials right now. The ones that have come out, again, are Moderna, and then these companies in Beijing. But the safest and most efficacious vaccines were not necessarily the first ones through clinical development when you look back at history. Only 16% of vaccines actually have shown to work. And that means that 84% did not. So again, we need to make sure we're careful and that we are scientific and rational about how to test these vaccines. And then when something is working, we need to get it out there quickly. So I've heard that vaccines will be ready as early as this fall and as late as next fall. So that's a big interval, but we just need to be careful. But I think everyone's being cautious, but in best case scenario, it could be as early as this fall. That's what I've been hearing from uh, the regulatory agencies as well as companies. I hope that's helpful. I wanna make sure that you also know that we are so incredibly thankful in our center for you and your partnership. We have been working round the clock on food allergy research and we have not stopped any of that research while COVID is going on. In addition, we've been doing COVID research and so with that, there's just so many people that we have here at Stanford. There's just so many people that we collaborate with. We're collaborating internationally across the globe on so many of these items. And there are so many people that care about this disease and allergies and asthma. So I can't thank you enough for all of your support. Philanthropy accounts for 94% of the center's funding. I hope that each of you feel proud of the work that we're doing as well as what we're accomplishing. And none of this could have happened without you. So thank you again, and I'll turn it over to Lindsay. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you, Kari. And we have had a very active Q&A. So thank each and every one of you. Again, if we cannot get to your question, we will follow up via email or phone call in person, uh, depending on how lengthy the response might be. So the first question is going to be for Sharon. Uh, make sure to unmute yourself, Sharon. And that is from Kathy in Chicago. I just want to say some of the cities because we have representation across the entire nation here. But what Kathy asked is, is there any data Data on people who have severe food allergies and have been COVID-19 positive. How do medications used for allergies and asthma affect the immune system? For instance, Zolaire suppresses certain antibodies. Is this true? Kathy, hi. Uh, thank you so much for your question. And um, this is an excellent question. This is exactly what um, we were wondering. Um, when when we when the pandemic first uh, occurred, and so um, what we can do is look back in history and see how um, how allergies and how asthma have been affected by other viruses, um, and particularly because Zoller has been used to treat allergies and asthma for 
um, almost 20 years, we can look back at that kind of history. And in uh, looking back, we've seen that Zoller has actually been protective in virus responses. And um, really, we wanna encourage everybody to continue to control their environment and take their controller medications for their allergies and their asthma um, so that that levels the playing field and makes you healthy and not so reactive to your environment um, that you become more reactive if you were to become infected with um, SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, we don't know. We have to look at this moving forward. Our best guess is that uh, we've seen where Zoller has been helpful in antiviral responses, surprisingly, because it's an anti-IgE medication, which is purely um, allergy-driven. But we have seen that in the early Zoller studies where kids going back to school during the fall actually didn't have huge viral exacerbations like they normally did if they're uh, if they were being treated with Zolaire for their asthma and allergies. So um, we, uh, we want our families to continue to take their medications. Um, and this is something that we're really interested in looking at moving forward. Um, and particularly, uh, I'll tell you, I've been seeing my asthma patients in my, in my clinic at Stanford and our food allergy patient families as they're coming into our research center. And I'm just so proud of all of you guys. Uh, because you've been doing such a good job of sheltering in place and um, keeping clean and making sure that you're wearing masks and washing hands. Um, and so some of the data is actually skewed because I think that you guys have been super cautious and really not getting exposed uh, to the virus. Um, and for that reason, I think it's really important to be able to design approaches to be able to understand our community that's living at home um, with allergies and asthma. So how can we reach you in your home so that you don't have to leave um, to participate in our research um, and we can still track that you're not only taking your medications, but you, you have access to medications. Um, you know, uh, uh, our albuterol inhaler um, uh, went on a run and there were lots of pharmacies that didn't have it because um, it was being used to treat uh, patients with COVID-19 in the hospital. And so uh, these are some of the things that we're really trying to understand and make sure that our families have access to medications, that they're using their medications, and how, um, how they're doing as, as we move forward. So these are some of the approaches that we're super excited about at the center. Perfect. Thank you, Sharon. And now we have a question for you, Scott, from Melanie in Los Angeles. And her question is, what is the earliest you can test to see if you have the virus after potential exposure? Can you get tested the day after exposure? Or do you need to wait a few days for the viral load to reach a particular threshold for diagnostic tests, perhaps three to five days? Yeah, so I think, I think the, uh, the testing for the virus is more likely to be positive if you wait a, a, a few days, but uh, exactly how soon in a given person would probably depend on how big a dose they received from the exposure that they had. Um, but I think it's, yeah, if, if you think you've been exposed, I think the likelihood of having the test be accurate um, if it's positive would be better if it was, if you if one waited a, a few days would be my guess. Because as you say, the virus starts off with, you know, a certain number of viral particles enter your airway, for example, and then it does take a little while for them to infect cells, have more viral particles produced, and proceed with the infection. So well, the uh, likelihood of getting the, the correct positive answer, if that's what's happened, would be um, greater. If you, you know, if you did it five minutes after you got exposed, it would be uh, less likely to be positive. But, um, that's my impression. Okay, great. Uh, next question for Kari. This is from David. I think they're in New York City right now, but could be elsewhere. Um, do you see any potential benefit to programs like One Day Sooner, who are compiling a list of people who would volunteer for human challenge trials for COVID-19? Great question, thank you. I was hoping someone would ask me about the human challenge studies. Um, these are quite controversial, uh, and we so appreciate the fact that people would even think about doing these. I know that from uh, a lot of scientists that have done vaccine studies, uh, to some extent, human challenges are really helpful to know a critical piece of knowledge, which is 
Um, can I be infected? Does the vaccine help? What we're trying to do is actually set up assays so that people don't have to undergo human challenge studies, that by doing vaccine studies, you can see if you can be prevented from having the virus by looking at your cells in a culture dish or by looking at antibody formation so that you don't actually have to see if the person themselves have to undergo the challenge. That's a little different from food allergy where we actually do challenge you and we see whether or not you have a reduced reaction to a food. We don't want to necessarily do viral challenges for a lot of reasons. Also, because they don't necessarily reflect what happens in real life. And so but human challenges throughout the world have been discussed, but right now they're kind of on hold because they don't want to put anyone at risk. Um, but it is a really interesting aspect of how can we as people be of service to help understand and so I'm happy to talk offline about other things that if people are really wanting to be engaged and help out with the research, there's other ways to do that as people, as volunteers, and I'd be happy to send some uh, resources about to the people here on the phone, uh, excuse me, on the webinar. Great, thank you. So this is going to be the last question. And again, we received everyone's questions. We just couldn't get to them all. We will follow up separately. And this last one is for Kari as well, um, from Brian in Chicago and several others that asked kind of getting back to normal. What does that look like? What about routine appointments, dentist, ENT? Should we wait or keep on a normal schedule? And also what about summer camps and schools? Um. Well, that is a great question to end on. I think we all want to get back to normal. We all want to protect our safety. But in that, it's going to have to be a staged process. You heard from Dr. Shinpoja about the fact that we still have to be careful. When you look at those countries that have gotten back to normal, like Sweden and other countries that have come back without a lot of testing, they see little blips and increases of the epidemic in their society. So we should be careful. But what does that mean? That means we should use science to direct how cautious we have to be. And there's just so much of shelter in place, I understand, that one can do, especially for businesses, especially as we think about this virus and how we can treat it. And now that we have, compared to three months ago, some therapies in our pockets, and Sharon talked about that today, we now have some vaccine candidates but yet we don't know exactly when they'll be coming. We should be cautious. And importantly, I'm hoping that there will be some guidelines coming out soon in terms of reopening schools, reopening camps. I understand to, to some extent this is county to county specific and state to state specific, and it will a lot of times depend on governors and leadership in each of our individual structures across the US but hopefully we'll also be taking our lead from countries like Korea, from other countries. I hope that testing will occur more frequently so that we can open up um, in a way that's based on science. Right now, I don't know when that will happen, but I do hope that at least now here where we live, there are dentists, there are ENTs, there are lots of telemedicine uh, appointments happening. Sharon mentioned how much digital health is being used now to supplant what otherwise would have been a face-to-face -face visit. So I think we've learned a lot about how to deal with telecommunications as physicians, as caretakers, that actually might be helpful in the future no matter what. But that to the degree by which we're trying to protect society, but also normalize society, I think there's a critical balance right now that's happening. But I do believe we're gonna to get to normal. I just don't know when. But it will come through a lot of good guidelines based on science. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Sharon and Scott and Kari. Thank you all for, for coming. I mean, really, this has been illuminating. I know I took tons of notes. I'm sure everyone else did on the call. And I also want to thank each and every one of you that joined us today, truly. Um, you spent one hour learning with us, and we are so incredibly appreciative.
As you've heard today, there's a lot of work that has been done, but there's still a lot more to be done. And that's where we are calling on you and asking for you to consider supporting us. And that, that can be done in several ways. First, we have a COVID-19 general fund set up at the center, and that is specifically set up for expendable, flexible, discretionary support. So as this virus changes and the uh, needs move, we can move with it. Second to that is if you were inspired today by one specific area, perhaps you want to support antibody testing or, or some of our work with families, um, that's where I come in and my colleagues at the foundation. We would be happy to put together a specific proposal based on your interest and facilitate that. And then lastly, we hope that each and every one of you will share this webinar recording. As Kari said, there's a lot of misinformation in the news, and we are committed to sharing up-to-the-minute information that you can count on from us. You'll receive an email tomorrow in your inbox, and that will have all three of these things. So it will have my contact information, the doctor's contact information, and also um, the webinar recording, which you can share with your network. So again, I want to thank you all. Philanthropy fuels discoveries and fuels research. We are so incredibly grateful for your ongoing support. And to each of the three doctors that joined us today with incredibly busy schedules, thank you so much. I look forward to seeing each of you in person very, very soon. And have a great rest of your day. Bye.